Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Neil Wilkinson, a legendary UK-based uh, session drummer, to talk about his lessons with the great teacher Max Abrams. Neil, welcome to the show. Hey, Bart. How you doing? Good to be here. I'm great. Um, I'm really excited about this one because uh, I love focusing on the teachers, um, and there's uh, there's a lot of legendary teachers where people may not know about him. Um, like I know Max, I've heard of his name as being um, a teacher to people like Stuart Copeland and Simon Phillips, uh -huh. and um, obviously he was your teacher. But um, why don't you just tell us about this uh, this iconic guy? Go back to the beginning of his. Uh, you know, his life, his career, and, and yeah. run us through it. Yeah, well, uh, to to uh, just to put him in a little perspective, I was at the NAMM show in, um, in uh, California maybe 15, 20 years back, and um, I was grabbing a little lunch at a restaurant nearby, and I happened to be sitting at a table next to Joe Morello, and cool. I was with my wife, and I couldn't help but say, hey, I've got to say hello to Joe, you know. So I leaned over and I said, "Excuse me, Mr. Morello, I, you know, just like to say hello." And I'm a big fan. And and he was very nice. He, you know, he was uh, he just was very nice to me. And and uh, I said, "Oh, by the way, I uh, studied for eight years with Max Abrams." And he put his knife and fork down again and uh, <laughs> extended his hand. And he said, well, now we're friends. <laughs> so that puts it into a little perspective. He just said, wow, wow, what a yeah. teacher. You know, he really uh, – so he uh, definitely got some um, international uh, street cred and respect among the greats, yeah. you know. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, Joe, um, there was a biography episode on here about Joe where, where – I mean, he's a drummer's drummer. He's not like a very nice guy, but like – he respects hard work and dedication and real deal teachers like that. So that's, that's saying a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And Max was, um, he was a real taskmaster, you know, he was a real like hardcore, um, you know, that I've always said that I think the closest, uh, analogy would be like a, a Victorian kind of ballet teacher that just would not mince words and would put you through the mincer every single time you went, you know, and it doesn't matter about physical pain or endurance. You're just going to do this. And, you know, if you're not yeah. interested, then don't bother showing up next week. I'll see you later. You know, it's like, it was pretty, for an eight year old. That's pretty, that's pretty hardcore, you know? Wow. Well, let's back up a little bit. So, yeah, yeah. um, so what is his era of like, like, do you know when he was born? I've actually looked um, online and it's kind of hard to find information yeah. about him. Yeah, I don't know. Actually, I don't know the exact year. I could probably, I should probably have Googled that just so I'm a little but, more aware. But ballpark. I certainly know that his uh, heyday of playing was the uh, kind of big band golden era of, in the um, uh, kind of you know, thirties, forties, fifties through London. And he was, he played in pretty much all the well-known, um, London big bands that were playing. And sure. now those guys were the, the kind of, uh, the pop stars of the day. It literally didn't get any, any bigger, you know, because if there was a, a radio session or and when it became TV sessions, those guys were the musicians that got to do it because they were the best, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so he was playing with uh, Carol Gibbons and the Savoy Orpheans at the Savoy Hotel, um, Jack Hilton, um, let me think, Geraldo, um, mm. all these incredible – I mean, they were like the cream of the crop in, in sure. London, you know. And, uh, yeah, so – and he told me once um, – I was telling him about uh, about how it is to do a hotel gig now. You know, we've all been there and done the uh, embarrassing hotel gig, you know, where you have to load your gear around the back through the kitchen, you know. And he said, no, 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 not in my day. He no. said, "He said the guy, the uh, porter opened the door for me and said, good evening, Miss Abrams. And he said, no, no, I was helped him with my equipment. And I was, oh, my. well, that's, you know, that's what I mean. They weren't kind of hired hands, these guys. They were really... A big deal, you know. No, and it it comes up in a fair amount of episodes where where you have to put into perspective that the um the hotel was the and I was actually just it was weird. I was talking to my wife about it yesterday for some odd reason. Usually mm -hmm. she glazes over when I start talking about uh, drum history stuff, but <laughs> but it was like 
I was telling her, no, the the hotel was like the the hot spot. That's where and then I said, you get, you know, the Gretsch broadcaster and the Slingerland Radio King. And then Absolutely. I lost yeah. But um but no, it's it's the it's the you know the happening. It's kind of cool to think about that. People like you know you're there with your martini and you're oh. there, you know you're at the Ritz and it's yeah, yeah. I mean, nice. yeah. I mean, and just the the the, the glamour and I guess the uh, the uh, the kind of movie stars of the day and uh, the all the you know I guess all the politicians of the day would be at the Savoy in their finery and there's Max in the background just stirring the soup at the back with the brushes you know and yeah. um yeah and he and he did you know he did a lot of cruise ship work too you know uh, and again you know like as i say this is way before uh, any kind of um uh studio uh, career was possible or um, or a touring career or anything so he had ri- literally reached the pinnacle of his career you know that was it that was as big yeah. as you could get so he t- there was a, um, a radio show here called Workers Playtime, and uh, they, you know, obviously needed a, a band to supply a little music. So they hired uh, all the uh, the best musicians of the day. So he was the drummer on that, you know. So he, I guess, he was one of the first call early session musicians, you know. Wow, which I mean, kind of a that's sort of he laid the groundwork for guys like you. Yeah. hundred um, percent. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. It's so neat too, to think of the differences in, um, in studios and recordings. And a oh. lot of these recordings would be made. And, 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 uh, I know in America, I'm sure it's the same there. Like you were saying, the radio would broadcast from these hotels. Mm-hmm. Um, so, okay. So he's, he's full on, like you said, I mean, he has reached the top of the mountain. Right. Basically at that point. And that's probably what, like the fifties. I mean, I would imagine it it probably corresponds with like, um, rock and roll in the, cause the sixties things changed. Right. Obviously. But, um, and, in God, I always bring up the, the kind of like, you know, in that forties era, things were different. Obviously for you guys, I've had some British episodes on where, or some British Jeff Nichols has been on where they say, Oh, cool. Great. Yeah. In the forties. London was bombed. So, um, things had to be different then for mm-hmm. all these guys. Yeah. But, uh, actually to some degree, I think, um, there was that kind of, uh, you know, like to hell with this, like, we're just going to, the gig goes on, you know, like, uh, um, the, you know, movie theaters stayed open and, uh, I think yeah. and the hotel bands would just be playing the air, right. The air raid sirens would be sounding. Wow. And, um, and these guys, <laughs> you can imagine chandeliers being shaken and uh you know and and max still just tapping away at the background there you know <laughs> man <laughs> different world you know that's like a movie or something yeah like yeah exactly a yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely and actually Dust um everywhere. talking about him sitting at the back there and what you were saying about early recordings you know i mean i have a couple of um uh kind of uh, compilation records with uh, a few Max Abrams tracks on it. And you oh, can cool. barely hear him playing unless there's like a little two bar break where he's play. you know, you can just hear this kind of very polite timekeeping, you know, and then there might be a little kind of syncopated fill here and there, but it's, I think there, there was certainly no mics on the kit. I'm pretty sure it was just leaking into maybe one yeah. or two mics for the whole orchestra, you know, that I'm always um, and and you know I keep uh, kind of shooting myself in the foot because I say this and then I actually have to do it. But I want to do an episode on uh, early recording techniques where you look at you know a live performance on a stage with like uh, Duke Ellington or something, and it's like there's one mic. Yeah, like, absolutely. It's, it's just it's position of the musicians. It's uh, it's okay drums you be quieter piano you need to play harder yeah um, and and just, i think that actually what what you're talking about there is a um a, a quite a deep subject that i think musicians were very aware then of internal balance of how the rhythm section were balanced and how that yeah. reacted with the rest of the orchestra and um and i have i kind of carry that with me um mm. so sometimes you know when i get to a uh, a, a, a live gig or a TV gig or something, and there's like screens around, and I'm like, oh, geez, they they don't even know I'm going to play. They just presume I'm going to be smacking the hell out of the drums and 
you know, uh, and uh, often I'll, we'll, I'll say, can we just try with no screens a couple of times? And, and, um, yeah, uh, you know, maybe uh, it doesn't work all the time because a lot of times it's to do with maybe, uh, the strings are going to be near to me and they quite rightly don't want the, 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 the kind of bleed into their ears, you know, but, uh, yeah, there was certainly a, a more awareness of, um, balance between the instruments and also of course uh no in ears and things like that you know so you didn't have a guitar player kind of turning his ear pack onto 10 and his amp onto eight and his guitar onto seven and that's my sound you know yeah they were more aware of where they were playing the kind of tunes they were playing i, I think yep. it was a very interesting uh interesting time you know yeah and the humidity in the room and you're right you know right you're i mean that affects sound but also your uh, your drum heads are now <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like on, you know, completely loose. So, and, and I keep saying that we'll talk about it later, but I should say right now. So people know that we're referring to like studio stuff. I mean, Neil, you are, you have your, your credits are, I'm looking on the Gretsch website here. Like you've played with Van Morrison, Paul McCartney, Ray Charles, Annie Lennox. I mean, you've got, I mean, you've, the the movies like star wars i mean yeah so you know what you're ta- <laughs> you know what you're talking about when it <laughs> when it comes to this stuff but we'll we'll talk about that a little bit later so great. um great uh all right so did his career did he just sort of naturally wind down from being a performer to then being a teacher or uh, how did that transition go yeah i know for sure that it was a uh, a conscious uh, move on his part you know um I think he just, uh, maybe things were changing. And uh, I know also his schooling that he had, he was very, um, uh, very schooled in rudiments and he could, his reading was, um, he could read anything, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so he was um, kind of primed to be the, the teacher of the day, really. So he was constantly getting people say, hey, could I come by for a lesson? Could you show me this? How do you do this? Could you, you know. And I think he just thought, this is crazy. I could just live in Chelsea and uh, and teach, you know. And uh, yeah. so he kind of just turned, he just sort of shut the door and turned his back on it, you know. And mm. um, I think he was, um, I think it was possibly his uh, main calling, you know, because he was really good. Yeah. He was really good. Well, that's very, very similar to um, Joe Morello, where Joe performed forever, but he really taught. I mean, he he became uh, obviously as a student of um, Stone, but then mm-hmm. he he was, you know, teacher, and then kind of helped create the modern, you know, the modern uh, clinics that we have today. But it's very similar where they're these guys maybe you know all of their and Jim Chapin and these guys their 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 years of performing really lead up to they're better known. You know, uh, I don't know, a hundred years later, that's probably too far, but, mm-hmm. but like, um, as teachers than they are performers. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. And, um, uh, on a, on a little side note here, um, Max, uh, th- there's a, there was a, uh, a guy in England called Bob Armstrong who passed away a couple of years back now, um, who was a pupil of Max's and he, beca- it was the same story with Bob. He was a player for a while around London and then just did the same path, you know, just kind of mm. shut that down, opened his studio and just thought, that's me now. I'm, I'm, um, I'm the teacher of, I'm the UK teacher, which he was, you know, it was amazing. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a noble, I mean, it's, it's awesome. It's like, we're all drummers, you know, you can't. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, probably a more, uh, not safe, but it's like, I mean, he was probably getting older. Mm-hmm. And it was becoming more of like, a, this is a bit easier. They come to me kind of thing. Right. And Max, uh, I'm guessing if we're talking about the 50s, I don't know. Max was maybe in his, I don't know, in his 40s or something. You know, he, he certainly mm-hmm. wasn't an old man by today's no. standards, but maybe sure. by then he just felt like I need to just settle down or something, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, his... Um, I think, to be honest, he really had the knowledge. He really had all that experience, the playing experience. He knew his rudiments like probably better than anybody else in the UK, um, having done all the Scottish pipe band thing. Um, and 
you know, I often think about him now um, with the COVID uh, environment that we're in at the moment. Um, you know, it seems like everybody and their dog is uh, online saying, hey, hit me up for lessons, you know, yeah. and I can hear, I can hear Max's voice over my shoulder saying, well, what is he going to teach you? <laughs> he uh, was man. He, he was so brutal. I mean, he, it was just lethal, you know. And so, if you weren't if you weren't really pure and knowledgeable, he would call you out, you know. So, wow. uh, some. I mean, I, I honestly wish that there, there was uh, a bit more of his uh, honesty flying around the internet. It would <laughs> it would be great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And well, all right. So. Um... So I know you said, did you say you were eight years old when you took lessons with him? Yeah, I, uh, wow. I, I, I went to Max from when I was eight until I was 16. And it's a really interesting way um, that I got the uh, link uh, to study with Max, which was also equally as old school. Um, it sounds like we're talking about 200 years ago to me now. It's crazy. You know, <laughs> we're talking exactly uh, 50 years ago to the day um in august wow. august 15th 50 years ago wow. was the my first lesson with max abrams i was eight years old amazing so um what happened was that summer of 1970 uh i was with my parents we were on a holiday you know just a little seaside vacation in a town called margate a little uh seaside town in kent and uh for some unknown reason, I'd been playing drums for about a year. My uncle was my first teacher, actually. And uh, so I'd been playing for about a year. And I entered this talent competition for some unknown reason because I was very shy. So hmm. heaven knows what made me do I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, I, uh, I guess I did okay. And I, I won some little kind of cool, like, man from uncle kind of briefcase or something you know it was very cool, cool. Yeah, yeah 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 it was great and then uh, uh maybe a, a little later this guy this chap appeared at the our table and he said to my dad uh, hey um i think your son should have lessons and i know my dad you know like I, I could imagine him looking him up and down and going oh yeah <laughs> you know like yeah and what do you you know who are you what do you want you know and <laughs> and uh he produced a, his uh, business card, and he was from the Melody Maker. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it was a um, it was a, a music weekly magazine. Uh, yeah. Actually, it was more of a newspaper. It was a, an actual, uh, you know, big kind of spread sheet newspaper. Yeah, cool. Um, and in the back were all the contacts for you know bands looking for drummers and uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know. Um, this chap, the, the chap from uh, Melody Maker, was a guy called Chris Hayes, and uh, he contacted Max uh, on my behalf, and Max agreed to give me six lessons, which Chris unbelievably paid for. Oh, my God. So, yeah. So Chris from Melody Maker saw your talent show performance. Yeah. Said, I, yeah. And then he said, uh, and then he contacted max and then he believed in you so much he paid for your first block of lessons yeah yeah exactly you were discovered yeah and it was unbelievable you know my my dad uh, and I, I have the letters now you know and it says to my dad um you show up uh, at max's at uh, whatever time on saturday and then there's a letter from max saying which uh, train station to get off and all this stuff. And, um, yeah, it's very, wow. very cool. That time period you went is super just like, it couldn't be better. Eight to 16. I mean, that is literally the most like formidable years. Yeah. Probably in your life. Yeah, you know? I, I, absolutely. Um, and, uh, I have to put it into a little perspective because my uncle was a big band drummer. Uh, and so he was, um, all the time at home, I was hearing, He'd play me, you know, Duke Ellington, Cat Basie, Buddy Rich, et cetera, et cetera, you know. Um, so um, I, I, it wasn't like I was going home to nothing. You know, I was going home and I had my sure. uncle kind of um, kind of keeping me under his wing kind of thing, yeah. you know, which yeah. was very cool. Um, and also my brother was living at home still. He was He's 13 years older than me. So 
you know, I was hearing um, he was very heavily into Beatles and Motown and the, the Rolling Stones. I was hearing lots and lots of different music. Um, um, so uh, I wasn't left alone between my lessons with Max, you know. No, which is yeah. a good thing yeah. to yeah. point out. So people aren't like, um, it's almost more of a, it would be more of a struggle if you didn't have that. I don't think it takes away from it all, but it's good to say like, yeah, you had support and you had, I mean, yeah, it, yeah. It doesn't end when you leave the lesson room. It takes constant. You know, right. And uh, unlike now where you have the, uh, the um, valuable internet, and uh, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, and people, you know, where you could find some inspiration just by looking online, you know, um, then you really had to go and look for this stuff, you know, um, sure. which was, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, it was, um, it was a very interesting time, but, but then, um, I did start playing, uh, gigs not long after that. And, um, I guess we'll get into some of Max's uh, approach, but he was pretty hard on reading. So by the time mm. I was kind of 10 or 11 and I started to do local little, uh, small gigs, you know, and, and uh, rehearsal big bands, that kind of thing, I could already read pretty well, you know, so that was, uh, that was great. Yeah. So you were eight years old. That would have been what, 1970. Uh huh. So, um, and I want to hear about his other, obviously, mega famous students as well. But I just, like you said, so let's talk about him as a teacher. So yeah, you said, me, not mean guy, but like, like almost sounds like a drill sergeant kind of. Uh, like, absolutely. Um, that's exactly. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Now, was he that way? Was there any, was he compassionate at all? Was he nice to an eight-year-old? <laughs> like, um, well, the, uh, you know, the funny thing is... Um, yeah, I think he was compassionate, but he just didn't. Um, he just didn't kind of ease off on the gas pedal, you know. He just kind of was. Um, Come on, do you want this? How badly do you want this? You know, he yeah. he never once kind of. Uh, I mean, I'm, I, I do have recollections of him kind of saying, "Well done," something like that, you know. But never yeah. overly, you know. Like now, people almost few people are like, even if you did horrendous on your lesson. Your teacher is expected to say, uh, "Oh, you're sounding so great, wonderful," you know. Yeah, <laughs> and he no, would, uh, totally. no, no, you're not going to get that, you know. Did I he have kids? No, he didn't actually. Okay, and yeah, my, I'm just curious because yeah, and uh, it, it, that's interesting point you bring that up because my mum remembers that one time he said uh, uh, something something about I can't remember the ex exact context, but he referred to his boys. And my oh. mum said, oh, so you, oh, you have sons? And he said, no, no, no. I mean, my boys, my, my drummers. I've got to look after my boys. You know, I've got to make sure <laughs> these guys are, you know. So that was definitely his focus. It was, uh, you know. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so he would give you, what was a typical, so you said he focused on reading a lot. What mm -hmm. was a typical lesson like? Maybe not when you're, maybe not your day one, eight-year-old lesson, but let's say you were, 12 years old, right? Uh, you've been there for four years, you're gigging a little bit. Um, what was like a, what would it be an hour? Yeah, it would be an hour. And I'll just touch on the first lesson for only this reason. Sure, please the, do, yeah. The first lesson was on the drum set in the top room. And then he had a room downstairs. Um, actually, if, I can't remember, but he may have had two other rooms. Um, but certainly the drum set was in the top and downstairs were... Uh, practice pad uh, drum sets. Hmm. And the only lesson for about the first three or four years that I had on the drum set was number one. And every other lesson after that was on the pads. So, oh. um, yeah, it was kind of a uh, rite of passage to uh, get back on the drum set, you know. <laughs> yeah, like he, he hooks you with the fun of yeah, being on a drum exact, set. Exactly, yeah. So, wow. yeah, it would be uh, – he had a very interesting way of working. Um it would be exactly an hour. And somebody pointed out to me uh, that I didn't notice this, but somebody pointed out to me that his uh, clock was always five minutes fast. <laughs> so <laughs> so he'd Skipping. go, up, oh, up, oh, time up, you know. <laughs> so, wow. So pretty uh, pretty hardcore there. But um, well, in, in contrast to that, in the Joe Morello episode, I, uh -huh. I learned that they would be like four-hour long lessons oh. where they would take like they would then go to lunch they would then, um, and this is with Steve Fiddick who took lessons with him, where they became like, it was like a friendship. And it sounds like it was the exact opposite of, of Max, where 
you know. Yeah. I mean, there's I act- no right or wrong. Yeah, I don't actually know anybody who became any of his students who became his friends that would want to go back and hang out. I mean, <laughs> I, I will, um, I'll touch on that later, but I did go back and see him when I moved to London and was getting, I was doing okay in London and working. And I went, I was think I was about 25 at the time. And I went back to see him, but we can talk about that later. So, yeah, sure. A typical would be uh, typically about an hour long. Yeah, an hour long. Um, and he would have this prearranged thing, you know, the his he, either his um, book would be open on the music stand or some exercises he'd written out or a big band chart. And then he had this really great system of um, he'd always have pre-recorded lessons on a reel-to-reel tape. Hmm. And that might be him. Uh, let's say you had a bunch of um, paradiddle exercises to go through. Well, it would be him, like say I don't know twenty exercises or something. He would have it uh, a a uh, a reel to reel tape of him playing those exercises. So hmm. the first maybe five minutes, ten minutes, he'd sit you down and he'd say, "Okay, play me exercise one," and you'd play that, and then he'd say, "Okay, have a look at uh, bar twenty four, you know." And uh, oh, oh yeah, okay, and you know, I'd, I'd, he'd say, "Okay." And then he'd, he'd start the reel-to-reel tape, and that, that there would be him talking, saying, "Okay, let's start exercise one, and uh, here we go, one, two, And then he would be playing, and you'd have to play along with him. Wow! It was pretty cool because if you got lost, you could kind of hear his sticking where he was, and you could pick it up, you know. Yeah. Um, but interestingly, <laughs> this is what. Uh, this is where the jury's out on whether this is a good uh, good move or not. I actually think it's a great move, but he would leave the room. <laughs> and sometimes, I'm just like, what an easy way to do a lesson. Yeah, for him. yeah. And then, so you know, sometimes you could hear a guy upstairs or downstairs or whatever. He'd go and check on him for a minute, probably. But the cool thing was, you never knew where he was. So he, yeah. you know, the nerve, the, the nerves were gone a little bit because he wasn't stang- standing over your shoulder, but the pressure was still on because he could be right outside the door, which is like five feet behind you, you know? Yeah. Uh, so the pressure's still on, but um, reading in his diaries, which I got years later after he passed away, um, he wasn't outside half the time. He would be, uh, there would be reference to him, uh, cleaning the car <laughs> or, uh, you unbelievable. know, sit sunbathing on the roof for 15 minutes. And then he'd come oh back God. in he'd probably stand outside the room for five minutes and go, um, then he'd walk in and say, uh, so what's wrong with bar 24? I thought you, yeah. And you'd, that would always be the one that you struggled with. It was like, Oh man, he was listening. Oh, geez. Yeah. <laughs> it was really troubling, you know? Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, he had this very passive way of teaching, you know, Uh, that he wouldn't stand over your shoulder and spend the whole hour with you. When Um, I take a lesson, we all feel that way where, where, and I'm, everyone who listens to the show knows this, where I've, since I stopped taking lessons when I was 12 and then just went like straight into, you know, playing in bands for a long time. And I'm now taking them with Barry James, who's become a good friend. And um, he was a student of stone. But anyway, if I'm like, I'm practicing in the week and I'm nailing it and it's great. But then the second I'm like, yeah, okay, Barry, here I go. I'm like, it doesn't, it's not as good as when, when, when the, like you're saying, when the teacher's yeah. watching you. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, so, yeah. bear in mind if I was eight, nine, to, well, actually for, for many years, my dad or my mum or both of them would, would bring me down to London on the train. Cause I was from Coventry and it was like a hour and hmm. hour and 30 minute train ride. Wow. So, the, um, you know, uh, uh, Max would uh, say, okay, so, uh, let's look at what I showed you. So, uh, from the top, exercise one, and I would stumble, you know, and my dad, <laughs> I can hear my dad saying, he could play that yesterday, oh. you know, and Max would go, he had this great mid-Atlantic Glaswegian accent, you know, from Gla- he was from Glasgow, but he had a yeah. mild little American thing in there, you know. My dad would say, no, uh, oh, that's so strange, he could play it yesterday, and, my, and Max would say, well, he can't play it now. <laughs> <laughs> like, Man, he doesn't care. It's just so funny. Like he doesn't care who if he's talking to a parent. Doesn't nope. care if he's <laughs> no. Nope. In fact, uh, while this is uh, on my mind, um, I remember 
my dad had a very short fuse, you know, and um, uh, uh, the drums were facing the wall in in the studio. So I'm, bear in mind, I'm sitting at the kit looking at the wall and I'm probably 10 years old, you know. God. And Max and my dad are getting into this real kind of uh, heavy duty argument <laughs> about something, uh, <laughs> you know. And uh, Max, I remember Max said, okay, you can get out now and you can take him with you. And I remember, my, I, I just remember having my head in my hands like, oh, my dad's going to hit him. <laughs> <He's> gonna, <laughs> this is not going to end pretty. My God! And and my this dad just cal- my dad just calmly said, "Yeah, I'm leaving. He's staying." Oh. Wow! And I heard the door gently close, and I thought, "That's so cool." That was like a life lesson right there, you know. Yeah, and I'm sure yeah, my like, I'm sure my dad walked out in an absolute fury of red mist, you know. <laughs> yeah, and then he gets inside and goes, "God!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, but that is a life lesson of like. I feel like in that scenario, like your dad won. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I think it was over something very trivial, like, um, you know, Max saying, what did he get for Christmas? And my dad saying, oh, he got a new drum. And Max saying, what do you mean a drum? Was it a snare drum, a tom-tom, a bass drum? What was it? You know, I'm like, oh, I don't know. It was, you know, and that kicked off and, you know, something else. And before you know it, they'd gone through the roof, you know. <laughs> it was a yeah. interesting uh, dynamic between the two of them. You know? Yeah, but all this being said, it clearly worked. His technique obviously worked. It right. created right. some amazing drummers. Now, but I just I can't that you're right. Where is it good? Is it bad? That technique of leaving the room. I would love. I mean, I'm sure they they exist somewhere. I don't know if anyone has them, but though I wonder if those tapes of his lessons are out there. Well, I've got, uh, yeah, I have uh, my original reel-to-reel tapes, and I'm cool. so I'm so nervous about touching them because yeah. they're so old. So I'm um, I'm actually looking into uh, maybe a sort of a, a professional company that would maybe uh, yeah. transfer them for me because I, I yeah. don't want. I have a reel-to-reel machine too, but I don't want to risk. Um, you know, a 50 year old tape, just putting it and having it crumble. I don't know whether they need to be kind of baked or, uh, yeah. or treated in some way. I don't, I don't know. I've done that. I've never done reel to reel, like, you know, um, the thinner kind of smaller ones. I have personally, uh, transferred two inch 24 track tape. And for people who don't know, this is kind of a cool side thing. You have to, what's called bake the tape where you put it in little, it's kind of, I mean, it's really like a little, convection oven i mean it's it's an oven and it it heats up and you probably know better than me i mean i've only done it a few times but it um it then releases the like it's not so stiff like if you then start pulling off the the if you start trying to unravel the tape the magnetic really the information like the bass drum and the snare will just come off it'll flake off right um, there, there you go that's what i'm trying to avoid i'm really you know i look at them they're, they're at my parents place and i look at them every time i go there and think oh, i've got to do that i have to do it you know you do you should yeah, yeah 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 because they're personal too um he made them specifically to you these weren't generic ones that he would farm out to people um you know he huh. would he would talk to you he'd say okay neil uh let's look at this one and uh you know watch out for this you know remember the paradiddle was sticking in bar bar 11 and uh you wow. know at the end of that he'd talk about something and there was always a little reference halfway through and he'd say your name you know it was amazing that's different than what i originally i because i thought it was like okay max puts on he has 10 copies of the same tape so that's almost like he's putting in more work by yeah. recording these at home oh that's totally different than what yeah I thought. absolutely okay. because uh, in the diary he refers to it too he says uh something like um you know seven till nine p.m recorded a um you know a, a, a technique uh, a rudiment tape for dave smith or whoever you know yeah so uh, yeah he was obviously putting in the work you know totally yeah um yeah well, like I said, it, it got good results. So, um, all right. So maybe we, so you obviously were a great product. Let's talk a little bit about some of his other, uh, very, you know, esteemed students. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how did that, like, how did he get these guys? I mean, how, how did that happen? 
Well, there were there were a lot of um, he had a lot of pupils that were that went on to become very successful around like the London scene, you know, uh, who were maybe not household names at all, maybe not even in England, you know. Yeah. But they, a lot of his drummers became working pros um, to varying degrees. You know, they might just end up in like a. Uh, I don't know what you guys would call it. What what do you call those clubs? Like a uh, like a top forty band kind of thing. I mean, you know, oh, you know, like a cover band. Yeah, like a cover band in a uh, in a nightclub, like a six yeah. nights a week kind of gig. You know, um, but you know, being able to read anything, being able to play, they're not going to be able to. They're not going to be playing with. Um, they're not going to be a first call studio player. But, but he produced a, a lot of those kind of musicians, those kind of drummers. You know. Yeah. Um, uh, but then he also, uh, th- there were guys that just went to him for one or two lessons just for a, uh, just to get a real, like a, a, a like a, a tune up, like an engine tune up or a, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just wh- where am I? How am I looking? How's my playing? Uh, and then he had the top end guys like, um, Simon Phillips went to him for a while. Um, Stuart Copeland a little bit. Um, I don't know for how long. Um, yeah. and then, um, let's see, oh, there's, um, actually there was a very famous drummer here called Barry Morgan, who was a, uh, he played on lots and lots of big, big records. He was, uh, oh, maybe around in the sixties and seventies was his, uh, studio time, you know, with, um, him and Clem Catini were like the kind of, uh, the American, the LA equivalent would be like Hal Blaine and, uh, Earl yeah, Palmer, okay. you know, those guys like sure. a wrecking crew days, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Barry's, uh, Barry Morgan's son, Brett is a really great drummer. And, um, Barry just sent him to max. He said, nah, you got to have the best, you know, you got to go to max. And, yeah. um, you know, he could have e- easily learned from his dad, you know? Um, but, uh, he went to max for quite a while. Well, it's different if you have a family member teaching you right. versus a, uh, a uh, dr- drill you know yeah a drill sergeant kind of guy yeah absolutely so um yeah and his um oh and there's also a, another guy i should mention who's um probably not a household name to you guys there but really highly thought of in the london studio um recording scene and he's a tremendous big band drummer a guy called mike smith and uh he went to max for many years too maybe about the same time as I did about eight years or so. And, uh, Mike is a completely, uh, I guess this is the, uh, what I think of, of, of the mark of a really great teacher doesn't really put too much of themselves in, in you, you know? Um, now what do you mean by that? I, I think I know what you mean, obviously, but just maybe yeah, explain that a little bit. Yeah. Well, for instance, um, you know, and th- this is probably, well, definitely going against the grain of how most great teachers are thought of. Um, Max never, he didn't touch on technique with me at all. I mean, not even remotely. He didn't talk about upstrokes, downstrokes, hmm. match grip. That's interesting. Traditional grip, nothing. He didn't talk about style. He didn't talk about um, uh, anything. He just talked about what I felt, if I, if I have to sum it up, and I've thought about this before, obviously, um, is that I felt like he gave us all like a toolbox of what you need to play that instrument. Hmm. You know, like, sure. Um, I'm sure if you weren't making a very good sound, he would kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the one thing I, I do remember, he was very, very big on dynamics within your um, rudiments and making them yeah. swing, you know. Like, uh, I remember playing like, uh, you know, paradiddles, like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, and, and him saying to me, what is that? Morse code. <laughs> <laughs> Man, he's full of, uh, mean one-liners. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, uh, brutal. And then he would lean over me and just kind of play this beautiful kind of with a little kind of swing in there, you know, this, and the dynamic, the difference between the low strokes and the high stroke was like one and 10, you know, hmm. it was huge. And, and almost just by, um, demonstration, really, I got it. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I get it. Okay. Um, so, hmm. uh, but never any, uh, but, but basically, uh, so I think he, he kind of approached it from, look, you're going to need, you got to be able to play single strokes, double strokes, paradiddles, flams, drags, 
uh, you got to be able to read, um, you know, and he would take me through kind of classical snare drum parts and uh, camp basic big band charts um, mm, that yeah. he'd transcribed himself note for note. Um, and uh, I felt like there was no, you know, there was, there was no style involved. He didn't say this is how to play bebop or this is how to play um, Dixie or this is how to play reggae or anything like that. You know, it was just, yeah. that's how you play the snare drum and the bass drum gotcha. and the hi-hat and the, and the cymbals. That's it. So he's not creating clones of himself. No, no, not at all. Yeah, so cool. what I was going to say was Mike Smith, who had the same uh, amount of tuition probably that I did, at probably around the same I- time I did, came out a completely different drummer, you know. Hmm. That's awesome. And my, Mike is very akin to somebody like, uh, and I hope he wouldn't mind me saying it because I know he loves him, but he loves um, – of Kotler with um, yeah. Sinatra. He's got that yeah. thing totally down, you know, but he's, he's also a very contemporary player. I don't want to, uh, I don't want sure, to undermine no, what Mike does cause he's fabulous. But uh, yeah. if you want somebody to nail a big band chart first take with all those like classic setups and, and a beautiful sound, well, that's Mike all over, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now, let me ask you, because they're obviously the like, like you said, the household names, like the name, like your mom knows is obviously like Stuart Copeland uh-huh. or even down to Simon Phillips. Yeah. Um, guys like that. So they went as adults, right? Uh, like, were they successful musicians at that point? Or were they, was, was little Simon Phillips, <laughs> you know, 10 years old? Going yeah. Back? Yeah, he was. He was a boy. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was a boy because uh, interestingly, Max. Uh, played in Simon's dad's big band. Oh, Simon's cool. dad was called Sid Phillips, and uh, I think he played clarinet, if I remember rightly. And uh, Max was the drummer in uh, Sid Phillips' band, so hence Simon goes to uh, to Max for a few lessons to, you know, get get his uh, his stuff together. You know, gotcha. Yeah. So it was just a few. Just a few lessons. I think so. But also, uh, but I think he probably got his reading together with Max. And, um, you know, Simon was a big deal by the time. he Simon went through the uh, National Youth uh, Jazz Orchestra. So uh, his reading was pretty good. Hmm. Um, and cool. by the time he was uh, 15 or 16, he was majorly getting big, um, big uh, session calls in London, you know. Gotcha. Yeah, it's pretty awesome, you know. So I'm a, uh, I felt certainly like a, like I'd passed it. You know, I was 19 when I first started <laughs> doing my sessions in London. You know, and I was like, man, I'm so far behind Simon. You know, <laughs> I mean, 19 years. You know, you're still yeah. like a kid. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then, so Stuart Copeland, though, was he older? Because I, I, I guess I just think of like sometimes you equate things to like Neil Peart going to like. Uh, Freddie Gruber, and he's older, and he's you know an already famous musician. Was mm-hmm. was Stuart not the kid? Was he just still a younger guy too? Yeah, I think that they both those guys went to him uh, as I did before they became who they who we know them as. You know, it wasn't like yeah, yeah I know what you mean with Neil. Uh, yeah, going back and kind of going, I need to get my. Uh, I don't know my le- my traditional grip together or my jazz chops together or whatever you sure. know. Um, yeah. yeah, they just went for uh, proper proper lessons, you know. Wow. And, oh, uh, cool. yeah, the uh, one of the big guys that uh, I think uh, have you heard of uh, Jack Parnell? Yes. Yeah, Jack yes. was a, a pupil of Max's, and Jack, of course, was probably better known as a. Uh, a ranger conductor because he he uh, had his own big band and orchestras that would do all the big TV shows through the sixties. You know, you you would always see, you know, uh, like a variety TV show featuring the Jack Parnell Orchestra, and there they'd be, you know, like a you know thirty piece orchestra on stage, and Jack will have done the arrangements and and would be conducting. So, hmm. but he was a really great drummer too. You know, yeah, I know I've shared some videos of him online. Yeah, um, yeah. On social media, but um, wow. Okay, so then as we get further into it, um, what happened towards, I mean, did did he teach until the day he died or, or what happened towards the end of his, you know? Career? Yeah, well, actually, the, the short answer is yes, but uh, the long answer is that he, he did, but he kind of, um, I think he kind of eased off 
the gas at that point. You know, he he decided to move out of London, um, move down to uh, Eastbourne on the south coast, and he got himself a little apartment near the seafront and uh, and had a. I guess he was, you know, most people would call it retirement, but I think he was still having about two or three students a day. You know. Oh. But but I think yeah, but I think he was uh, kind of saying yeah yeah you'll be fine to anybody. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. Um, um, so I think it wasn't like he was uh, he, he wasn't that same um, uh, guy that would uh, hit you around the back of the head for a uh, a right left <laughs> instead of a right right. You know. <laughs> yeah. Now, what, how old was he when he passed away? What year did he? Uh, pass away? Yeah, that was ninety mid nineties. I think ninety four. Okay something like that. Yeah. And, um, wow. I went to his funeral and, um, uh, Oh, I, I should mention my good friend, Mark Fletcher, who we were from the same town. He became the house drummer at Ronnie Scott's for quite a long time. He also, cool. he also studied with Max for, for, for a while. And, That's um, awesome. we both went to Max's uh, funeral and, uh, we went back to his apartment afterwards and there was, everything was there. Everything. So we said, well, what's happening with all this stuff, you know? And uh, they they weren't sure. So we were worried it was going to be uh, just kind of dumped. Yeah. And there was a guy there who said, look, just take, if there's something you want, just take it. So um, I took some 78. Uh, he has these beautiful, um, they're 78 uh, RPM records of his snare drum technique uh, with a little kind of uh, booklet, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I have those so and I cool. took his diaries, 10 years of his diaries. But uh, actually, the um, I, I eventually found out that they didn't trash a lot of it. It went to be archived at uh, Leeds College of Music in the north of England. That's great. You, you were right to do that, though, because if, again, he doesn't have like – much of a family, I'm assuming, as an older guy that didn't have kids or anything. Then right, you, right. You could think it being just you know, let's throw it away. But yeah. Um, oh, actually, you know what? Now we get to the um, his funeral service. Um, probably his most famous uh, pupil is not even a drummer. His most famous pupil is uh, Jim Marshall from Marshall Amps. Yeah. Whoa. And he um, he uh, said a beautiful thing at Max's uh, funeral. He said, uh, if it wasn't for Max Abrams, there wouldn't be any Marshall amplifiers. He said, because I wouldn't have been in the business at all. Huh. So that's a kind of a weird uh, connection, but um, that was very interesting. You know, I didn't know Jim Marshall was a drummer. Yeah, apparently he started out as a drummer and went to Max and then for whatever reason fell into, I don't know if he played guitar, but he certainly got into... Uh, I guess he was hearing guitar players say, oh, man, these amps are terrible. We need something more, probably louder, I'm guessing. you know. Yeah, uh, maybe he uh, was like, wow, this guy's being really mean to me. I'm going to switch instruments. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, uh, yeah, that, that was great, great um, hearing Jim talk about Max. And he was very, he had a very fond memory of, of Max, you know. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's so cool. I mean, it sounds like, Sometimes tough love can be uh, a good thing and, and obviously produces great drummers and not, I don't want to say coddling, but saying, yeah, you're sounding good. Okay. Oh, you didn't practice. That's okay. Because I've, yeah. I've yeah. taught and, and I, that was me. I would say, oh, it's all right. You know. <laughs> but, I know. And, and um, I, I honestly, if I'm honest, I don't think it is a good idea to say that. I no. think you need a little, um, you know, I don't think you need to maybe go as far as Max would. But uh, but uh, I think a little just the honesty is is the best policy, you know. I think that's uh, and uh, and actually, um, although he dished out the tough love as you called it, um, when I eventually went back to uh, kind of uh, with humble pie, I went back to see him in my mid twenties. Uh, we went for tea at a local hotel in Eastbourne, and he had a briefcase with him. And uh, when he opened it, when we sat down for tea, he had all this stuff about me. He'd kept all these like oh, newspaper wow. cuttings and stuff from Melody Maker and all my <laughs> just things that he'd taught me. And it was like this whole kind of like, uh, wow, I was, I was just blown away. Man. Yeah. Uh, so That's there was obviously a, um, 
you know, there was a, a sort of a, a love there, but uh, I guess he he didn't feel comfortable showing it or whatever, you know. Yeah, you're you were one of his boys. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and uh, he, uh, I, I've got it somewhere. He pulled this napkin from the uh, table and wrote out this little thing, like a little reading exercise, and he <laughs> just turned it around. He said, "Play that." <laughs> <laughs> and it was just a, it was it wasn't any kind of drum thing it was just a rhythm you know in, and and wow. it was in cut common so pretty hard to read at quick tempo you know yeah and he said okay yeah and then he wrote something else and it was exactly the same rhythm but in four four you know and he yeah. went oh, okay and then he's uh, okay and then he wrote the same rhythm but in three four so it went over the bar line. I was like, oh, okay, I'm, you know, you're not catching me out. And he's like, oh, okay, okay. You know, <laughs> you <laughs> it was can't not test was, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool, though. Yeah. Okay, so um, I want to talk about. We're going to talk about uh, drum hangs, which is something really cool you're working on. But first, I want to talk about um, your career and just give us kind of the overview here. I mean, whoa, you have like, I mean, Paul McCartney, Ray Charles, like what. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just amazing. You've, well, you've done some really cool you know, stuff. Um, you, I, did, I found a, a letter, um, I think it was from Max Abrams, and I was about 13 or 14 or 15 around that, that time, maybe closer to the end, about 15, I guess. And Max had um, said that he was kind of training me up, uh, grooming me to be a, a session musician. And he wrote that to my dad, and I remember thinking, what does that mean, you know? But I guess he saw that I had some kind of ability to uh, play, um, to be able to read and to be able to kind of handle. Maybe he turned the stress on purposely so that when you get to a stressful studio yeah. situation that you can just go, oh, this is easy because Mac Max yeah. Abrams isn't here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> He's not quote unquote listening outside of the door. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, so basically he'd given me though, I could read, I could play any style I, I wanted that I so chose, but it just happened that I'd, I was very into uh, Motown. I was very into um, Beatles and, you know, and I, I discovered all the uh, great, um, uh, kind of studio players, you know, like Jim Gordon, Picaro, Gad, uh, yeah. Purdy, all those, you know, that great 70s time. I'd found all these guys. Um, so uh, my first gig was a big band gig down on the Isle of Wight, uh, like a 10-piece band or something. And that was pretty cool. You know, I was 17 reading. It was like six, six, uh, five or six nights a week. And off the back of that, I went onto the QE2 the cruise liner, you know, mm -hmm. uh, did that for a year. And uh, there were lots of London-based musicians on that ship, and they all said to me, you have to move to London. So uh, yeah. I thought, okay, maybe I'll, uh, I'll see what happens, you know. And, uh, yeah, so uh, it was uh, – I, I was working pretty quickly, but it was very uh, – like everything, it's, a, it's a, all a process, and it was very uh, – very gradual, you know, which was just what I needed, you know, sure. to kind of uh, be taking regular steps, but kind of small ones, you know. Um, but a, a really big one for me was uh, there were two great musicians in London called uh, Jim Mullen, a guitar player, and Dick Morrissey, a, a tenor sax player. And those guys had lived in New York for quite a long time. And when stuff, you know, with uh, Gad, etc., Richard T., uh, all those uh, amazing New York guys. When they yeah. when they uh, went off to Japan, uh, Jim Mullen and Dick Morrissey put the band together to sub for them at Mikel's in New York. So their band was Steve Jordan, um, Cliff Carter, all these great New York players, you know. And uh, by the late seventies, they'd moved back to London. So by the time I moved into London, about eighty one, um, when I was nineteen. Uh, I got that gig with them, and that was a very R and B groove based band, you know. Hmm. So I kind of landed on my feet. I couldn't believe it, you know. And they were the great thing about that was they were working uh, at least three nights a week, usually four. So it was like I, I was able to make a living, you know, at yeah. nineteen and doing these great gigs. And you know, word got out that I could read pretty well, and uh, 
and that that was it. I was playing. I, I started doing a lot of little jingles and you know and and still do you know things like that, sure. like TV adverts, radio, whatever. Um, but that was really great. You know, that I was into playing lots of different styles. I mean, I loved playing big band as much as I loved the R and B groove thing. You know, so um, yeah. I was ripe yeah. for the picking, I guess, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, what were the gigs like? Let's say the, yeah, obviously, you know, you said you grew up loving the Beatles. Like what was your experience like playing with uh, Paul McCartney? Yeah, that was great. I did two things with him. Um, one is a, uh, um, it's on his album called, oh shoot, what's it called? Um, Flowers in the Dirt. And it's a very Beatly thing to do, but he did this, uh, um, he had two tracks that he wanted to link together with a uh, kind of a big band section. Uh, And he had an American arranger called Richard Niles arrange a little piece to go uh, to to link the two tunes, you know? Um, So we went in and uh, they put the parts out and uh, we, uh, he wasn't there at the time. McCartney wasn't there. And the engineer said, uh, okay, let's run it down and I'll, um, I'll take it anyway and we'll, we'll have a listen, you know. So we hadn't played it at all. So uh, we ran it down and uh, Richard went into the control room, Richard Niles. Well, I think we all did. And he said, wow, that's exactly what I want, exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. He said, nice take. he said, I'll tell you what, let's just leave it like that, you know, cool. until Paul gets here. And so – Half an hour later, Paul comes in and he's like, hey, good morning, everybody. How's it going? You know, and uh, how's it going? You know, and Richard said, well, I think we've done it. (laughs) (laughs) And he says, oh, well, let me have a listen. So uh, he had a listen. He said, yeah, I like it. Sounds great. He said, but no one gets to leave. And And we were like, oh, what? And he said, I haven't heard you guys play it. So we, we had to go back out in the room. And we played it live just for him, and they didn't cool. record it. And he said, "Okay, now you can leave." <laughs> <laughs> Man, he's just like he's a real deal. That's just very. Uh, it was so great, fun. you know. And I got to hang out with him a little bit that day. Um, and then he called me back, which was really nice to do a. Uh, I've never done his band at all, um, but he. I did get to do a, a great single. I just hope it. Did, it was released. Um, but I just hope it gets to be uh, heard one day because um, it was a uh, it was Linda McCartney's forty fifth uh, birthday, so of course the he made a forty five single for her hmm. of a tune That's called cool. Linda, an old uh, standard called Linda, a double A side with two different versions, one a big band and one like a kind of Cuban version. Cool, yeah. Um, and uh, he, it's like a box of ten singles, and he, at the end of that session, he'd had them pressed, and by the time she got there, it was wrapped in ribbon, and he presented it to her as a birthday present. And I was, we were like, "Oh my god, this is unbelievable!" You know. <laughs> and uh, wow. at the end of that session, I was sitting in the canteen. It was great. Uh, I was sitting on my own, waiting for a cab, and uh, they came over and sat at my table and said, uh, "Oh." do you mind if we join you? And I said, no, <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> and he said, uh, oh, I'm starving. You know, uh, he said, do you want something to eat? I said, yeah, I'm, I, I'm starving too. And he said, uh, let's get some, there's a, a, a very Liverpool bit of slang for a sandwich. It's called a butty. Hmm. He said, uh, what about cheese butties? Do you fancy cheese butty? You know? And I said, yeah, that'd be great. So he called the guy over. He said, Hey, Three cheese butties and tea, please. You know, and that was it. And I thought, oh my god, this is amazing. That's <laughs> it. I can retire right now. You know. <laughs> yeah, that is so cool. But I, I do have a cassette copy of that. But I, I've never heard the actual. I, I wish I could have got my hands on one of those ten singles. But hopefully, it'll be uh, available at some point. You know. Yeah, I'd love like to a- hear that. Uh, wow, sneak out onto the internet somehow. You know, that'd be great. Oh man, before we move forward here i have to ask too like um star wars return of the jedi ah uh, yes yeah, yeah famously shot um in london which was like uh in my little knowledge about it, it was like riddled with problems with shooting and people not getting along and all that which is really kind of an interesting 
side thing. What was your role in that? Ah, yeah. Well, um, in the, I don't know exactly what year it was, 90 something, they, when they did the remastered versions, they decided to add, uh, I wish my boys were here because they could tell me exactly what they added. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they added little characters, I think, here and there. But in, in Return of the Jedi, they added a whole scene, which was um, like a nightclub scene. And uh, so uh, um, apparently I actually have a Star Wars character name, which is called Akrev. Oh and so I, and one of the guys on drum hangs actually sent me my Star Wars figure, uh, Akrev, which is pretty cool. I love it. You know, so I don't think any, uh, I don't think my boys care about any other credit other than I'm Akrev in Star Wars Return of the Jedi. No. <laughs> I didn't know the level of celebrity who I was talking to. Yeah. I didn't know I was talking to Akron. <laughs> it's crazy. So basically, what it was, and even this was, had a really great little side story. They'd re, I mean, it's it's old news now, so this won't matter if this comes out. But they had recorded the drums already in L.A. with Greg Bissonette, and uh, there was some union thing why they couldn't use it. Hmm. So I. Um, they brought the, the Jerry Hay, the uh, arranger, trumpet player. He came over to London and asked uh, this guy, Derek Watkins, who's the, well, probably the finest lead trumpet player ever, arguably. Um, we need a drummer. And De Derek very kindly recommended me. So anyway, I ended up doing this session uh, for Jerry Hay for, for Return of the Jedi. And Jerry handed me this drum part, which was written out note for note. So I presumed it was a transcription of what Greg had played. So I got very, very close to it, you know, and uh, Greg, uh, Jerry said to me, it's got to be exactly the same, you know. So he said, well, <laughs> it became like a game. He put mm -hmm. Greg up in the left speaker and me in the right, and we would sit in the middle listening to playback, and we would go, ah. It's close, but let's do one more, you know. So, okay, I'll go back out and do another one. A whole take, wow. not drop in, you know, but we do a whole yeah. take. No, 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 that's not it. That's not it. And after about, I'm guessing about, you know, eight or ten takes or something, I said to him, that's it. That's it. And he said, yeah, come out and listen. So I went and had a listen. And he, he, at the end, he said, you know, one more, one more. And I said, no, no, no. That it was exactly right. Yeah. It, there's not one... I, th there's nothing I could hear. And he said, I'll show you. And there's a cymbal crash that overhangs for about two bars. And in that silence, you could hear Greg tapping his foot on the hi-hat pedal. <laughs> and it was just a game. He said, come on, do another one with the hi-hat foot in wow. there. And I was like, yeah, come on. So I ran down back and we did another take and I tapped my foot and he said, that's it, man. You know. So, wow. uh, but you know, I did give myself, I thought, Maybe they'll tell people they, they did the session and that they'll use Greg's take. But when I listened to it back, I, I could tell they'd use my take. So, you know, this awesome. little, even though two people play together, you can always tell who it is, you know? Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. So that was very cool. Yeah. Really, really. That was a great session. Man. That's yeah. so cool. That's yeah. Just, uh, yeah. That's anything. Star Wars is its own kind of like to this day. It's still one of the biggest, like, you know, I guess. It probably is. And yeah. Is it the biggest, uh, what's the word? Uh, you know, not franchise, franchise is the wrong word, but you know, it, yeah, I think it probably properties. is. Yeah. Series of movies. Yeah. 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 Probably. Um, I, I actually, I really, really love doing movies because uh, it is a different, it's another level of uh, kind of concentration. You don't know what you're going to get handed out. You're going to be playing, often going to be playing live with maybe 80 people in the studio, you know, and you don't often get to do that. You know? no. So. Man, uh, that is awesome. But uh, so now we're going to do something on the show, um, which is a little bit different. We're actually going to switch gears. Um, Neil, you've been working with uh, a gentleman named Russ Gleason um, on his project called Drum Hangs. Um, Russ is a you know music industry veteran, has played uh, for a very long time. So I want to welcome Russ onto the show, who's going to talk to us about their project um, Drum Hangs. Russ, welcome. Hey, Bob. Great to be here. 
How you doing? Yeah, good. <laughs> this is this is cool. It's like a surprise guest for for listeners. Yeah, but, um, yeah. Popped in at the end, you know. Great, yeah, great to be here. <laughs> oh, this is so cool. So, so why don't you just tell us what Drum Hangs is? Um, just tell us all about it, and then um, we'll close out with that. I think that's a good way to end the episode. Yeah. Well, I think I think at the end of the day, it's a happy lockdown success story, I guess. And uh, there was so much. Obviously, we know what's happened with the COVID. Um, everyone lost their work and no one's doing anything and was locked down at home you know from march and um yeah. me and neil we speak you know pretty much every day you know and um i must say you know he's one of the greatest drummers to ever pick up the sticks you know he is incredible yeah. you know and i've sat in on sessions shows with him he's very uh amazing <laughs> hmm. so yeah i have to say that of course and you know sure. we talk every day and uh and Neil, one day it got to about one month into the lockdown. So it got to about April. I remember one day we sat on Zoom and we had a bit of a, and I've got the notes here and it says drums and tea with Neil. And the date's like the 16th of April or something. And I say, oh, you know, we've had an hour and uh, we were just playing. And he said, oh, that was good, that. And I said, he said, oh, I might do some Zoom lessons. And I said, no, you're Neil Wilkinson. I'm not letting you do Zoom lessons. No way. Like that. I said, hey, I've got this idea. And um, I'd already thought about this idea. And I said, look, what are you doing next Saturday? Let's invite some people along. And um, we can do a group Zoom thing and you can talk, you can play, and people will want to see you. So we did it on the Saturday. I just put it out to some friends. And uh, we had about 60 people turn up. And we were like, oh. And the energy that came off the screen when it happened, it was like everyone just went, yes, like this buzz of being so uninterested in music and uninterested in their drums and to actually feel this inspiration just bounced off the screen. And so we were like, wow, it just like two hours just flew by. We're like, wow, that was amazing. So we thought we'll do it again next week. And in the meantime, I'd been speaking with uh, Nate Smith, who's who's someone I know, and um, I've done some sort of put on some stuff with him before and been to a lot of his gigs and – so I'd said to him, hey, Nate, do you want to be a guest on this thing that I'm doing? And he said, yeah, absolutely. So we announced at the end of the second one with Neil that Nate was going to join us. And somewhere there's a picture of everyone's face in the gallery. <laughs> and they just <laughs> couldn't believe it. So, wow. you know, it was like, wow, we're going to, it's going to happen. So we went downstairs after the hang and I had dinner with my wife. And I put it on my Instagram that obviously Nate would be joining us. And then – about five minutes of digging into my, my curry that we were eating, my hmm. phone starts dinging, just ding, 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 ding. Like, yeah, oh, my God, what's happening? And it turns out Nate shared it on his story. And, he, of course, he's got 200,000 Instagram followers. Yeah. So I'm up for two nights running, responding to inquiries. Just I didn't expect him to do that at all. You know, I just <laughs> I thought it was going to be me and my friends, you know. So yeah. and then that, of course, happened. So then we had people from 20 different countries around the world joining us. Mm. Um, and it was an amazing hour with Nate and, uh, Neil always does a sort of intro at the start where he shares some ideas and then the guest comes on and, uh, it's very relaxed, informal and spontaneous and people get to interact with their heroes, you know? Um, God. and we've had Steve Gadd's been on twice, Vinnie Colliute has been on, Jack DeJanet, Jim Keltner, um, Simon Phillips is on tomorrow night. Um, obviously this go out at a different time, but, um, we've got Dennis sure. Chambers, Mark Juliana, Peter Erskine. Um, Carter McLean, Jonathan Blake, David Garibaldi, um, Steve Jordan, Gavin Harrison. I mean, the list goes on. J.R. <laughs> Robinson, uh, you know, the greatest drummers of all time have been on drum hangs. And wow. people are getting to talk to their heroes directly, you know. And it's a dream. And, and to be honest, it's a complete accident. And my my whole premise for doing it was because I realized all my favorite drummers probably had their work was probably cancelled. Well, it was, you know, nobody was working. Yeah. And yeah. I wanted to support them and I wanted to connect drummers worldwide. And that's kind of our tagline is connecting drummers worldwide. And I had to put the website together, drumhangs.com. And well, I've just been running since then. And, and playing music as well, I know is about being in the moment. And this whole thing with drum hangs has been about being in the moment, you know? Um, yeah. And it's completely, uh, I'm running, you know, <laughs> basically. Yeah, you're running. Um, and like right. I say, we've got people from, you know, over 30 countries around the world joining us every week. 
and uh, it's still very relaxed. It's the same as how it started, you know. But can you yeah. maybe clarify too, so people know, like, like is it's not like a Zoom lesson where they're actually like, like, is it more of like you just kind of sit and listen and they talk about the drums and they they kind of share some stories and they play a little bit for you? It's kind of like watching like a clinic at a drum shop. Yeah, right. Yeah, so drum hangs. We we don't record anything. It's all live in the moment. The artists are very, very relaxed. They're at home and they're sharing stories about their insights into music. They're also doing a bit of playing if they want to. And you're, you're seeing them really open up because hmm. we're not putting it on YouTube. It's like an old school clinic in a way where people can ask them directly questions and speak to them, you know, so they can meet their heroes. And um, it's really an amazing thing because if you were to meet a guy like, say, for example, you bump into Vinnie Colliuto at a gig, you're going to be so nervous. But because of the community we've built up, everyone's there together and we we all know that someone's going to ask the right question that's going to go deep, you know what I mean? And, and yeah. it's very cool what's happened, you know, because everyone is uh, – it's a lot of camaraderie with the whole thing. I've met people from all around the world. People will sometimes say to me, hey, Russ, like, do you want to Zoom to get to know each other? And I've met all these people, you know. I've never felt so connected when I've been sat in my house since March, you know. <laughs> so, Man, way yeah. to make lemonade out of lemons. I mean, I think that's – that good things can come from such a um, a really kind of, you know, bad situation that we've all been put in. So it's 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 cool. And, and I want to point out, too, that these are um, – obviously, there's a little bit of a conversion with – from uh, – pounds to um you know for me us dollars but these are not that expensive you're not charging 200 dollars for a half hour i mean these no. are these are really very affordable yes um, yes and so. and i didn't want to sort of do the whole thing where this it costs so much money you know it's like a almost like a crowdfunded thing in a way you know um yeah which is excellent. And we're supporting my heroes, you know, and we're connecting everyone at the same time. And, you know, I'm very much a, a drummer, you know, and we're talking about teachers and I studied with the great Jim Blackley who lives in mm -hmm. Canada um, and Bob Armstrong, who obviously went to Max. So, you know, and, and Neil is a real mentor for me as well. And um, so I have a real love for all these people and all these people from afar, I've made them my friends through listening to them. You know, I'm so familiar with these people's playing. And um, the amazing thing about the hangs is you get such an insight into the personality that when you're listening to them after the hangs, you kind of hear them in a different way. You hear them, them as the person as well. It's crazy. It's absolutely yeah. crazy. So it's, um, yeah, we've, we've really kind of hit on something um, which is very profound, I think. Yeah, that's so cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna definitely pick one out here in the next month or so, and and uh, and do one because I feel that where I'm like, God, I need to, you know, get around other drummers and be around other people and keep that motivation up. Exactly, um, exactly. And and I think that it was so scary when the lockdown happened. You didn't feel like listening to music. You didn't feel like getting to the drums. Both Neil and I felt like that. And to actually have this thing of like to be surrounded by like-minded people and we're all there kind of together. And, um, it's, it's a really wonderful thing. You know, it's, um, it's magic what happens to be honest. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I've got, I've got so many stories that have coming out of this thing. Um, I don't think anyone's probably dealt with 40 of the world's greatest drummers in the last four <laughs> months. Like no. I have, I mean, I, I, I'm writing a book about the whole thing because it's, so cool. it's seriously, um, astonishing i mean <laughs> yeah. i could tell you some of the stories on air but i i'd probably want to save it to be honest yes yeah, it's well, very cool yeah that's so cool and i mean it's all coming together for good and just like we're all drummers no matter how big you are at the end of the day um so again people can go that's drumhangs.com that's um, it. spelled exactly how it sounds and uh yeah, 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 we'll be pleased to welcome you and, you know, come and join the family because, um, and the guys, you know, who are special guests, they pop in and say hi, you know, I mean, you can be on a hang, I mean, you can be on a hang with Jack DeJanet and Vinny might be there or, you know, <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, you never know who's going to swing by. So it's pretty cool, you know, it's pretty cool. Yeah. It, yeah, it sounds like it's becoming the thing, like the, um, 
I don't know. You know what I mean? Like the the like the hang for lack of a better term. It's like the the drummer's spot. Um, so congratulations. I mean, really, that's that's so cool for both you and Neil to be, you know. Yeah, and to have that. Neil involved is just magic, you know, because he's um he's like I say, he's one of the greats, you know. And uh, yeah. yeah, so it's it's a real dream and I I have to kind of go, wow. But you know, it all stems from my love of music and my love of listening to these guys forever, you know, and, um, yeah, they're, they're my, all my heroes, you know, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's a great thing. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I think that's a super cool way to end the episode. Um, so first, thank you to kind of our, our surprise, uh, ending guest there, Russ Gleason, um, which again, drumhangs.com, go check it out. Um, I'll be on there on one soon for sure. And I'll post about it. And hopefully people who like drum history can come and we can all hang and watch one of our favorite drummers together. I mean, that sounds like a, you know, just an amazing thing to do to connect with people who like my show on your platform with one of our favorite drummers. It just couldn't be more drummy, you know? <laughs> 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 exactly. So <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Russ. And then a huge, huge thank you, obviously, to uh Neil. Neil, thank you for being on the show. Um oh, thank you, Bart. Yeah, real, real pleasure. I feel like we could do uh another couple hours easily, you know. <laughs> it's great talking yeah. to you. Really great. Absolutely. Well, and I should also call you Akrev, um, <laughs> your, your Star Wars name. <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah. yeah awesome well thank you to both you guys and i hopefully i can uh we can hang soon in one of the uh, upcoming drum hangs uh, it'd be great to see you any anytime you want to swing by bart just let me know you all know. right see you guys wonderful thanks so much bart if you like this podcast find me on social media at drum history and please share rate and leave a review and let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future until next time keep on learning this is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.